Tonight's video is brought to you by Magellan TV. January 7th, 2000 was the worst day of my life. That's the day my little brother went missing and never came back. To this day, I find it strange how you can start your day off so normal and have it end so traumatically. There's never a sign for this type of stuff. Never a feeling that something is off, not even so much as a nagging twitch that lets you know that your whole world is about to come crashing down. That's not how the universe works. Things happen without warning and there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop them. I don't feel like I need to detail the day step by step. I guess the most important things to note are that it was a regular school day. I saw my brother in the morning, told him I loved him before I left, and then never saw him again. I remember staying up for hours after begging my mom to let me go with her to look for him, but she shook her head violently with tears in her eyes, and she told my dad to keep me home and keep me safe. Neither of my parents used the word missing, but I wasn't stupid. They told me they'd find him after the police got involved. They said he'd likely come back in a day or two. But that day turned into weeks. And those weeks turned into months. And those months turned into years. Not a damn trace. I think the only thing worse than having a loved one go missing is having them go missing with no hope of recovery. At least for other people, there's something. A sighting here, a footprint there, a piece of clothing, or other personal items that can somehow suggest something. For so long, I would have taken false hope. Give me something to smile about and cling to as some kind of proof that we could get him back. And we got nothing. As you'd expect, this depressed me. I was 15 when he disappeared. I managed to make it through school, go to college, get a job, and by the time I was in my early 30s, my parents decided to move out of our childhood home and switch states so that I and my expecting wife had a permanent home to live. But all this at a cost. There were a lot of moments in my life where I was mean and bitter. It was hard for me to form relationships with people because I was always afraid that something would take them from me, which caused me to break them off first before I could get hurt. This impacted my wife the most. We had more than our fair share of road bumps, and to this day, I'm trying to make amends for them. It was just hard. Trusting that she would always be there is still a struggle for me, but at the same time, having her and having a son was allowing me an opportunity to truly move on. I took up hiking as a way to clear my mind of things, and... I found that getting in touch with nature really helped me to rid a lot of my anxiety and stress associated with his disappearance. Our house had a good amount of woods behind it, so I'd often explore there when I didn't feel like making the journey out to other places. As I hiked deep through our woods on an early Saturday morning, a particular tree caught my eye. It looked a bit smaller than the others, and at a passing glance I thought it had a strange growth on it. Out of curiosity, I walked over to inspect it and gasped at what I saw. I saw what looked like a petrified human face in the trunk. It looked to be in such indescribable agony. I felt my heart racing with fear as to what could have caused it. I was sure for a moment that this had to be a coincidence, this had to just be a very coincidental human-looking tree until I looked to my right and saw another face on the trunk of a different tree. This one looked more feminine, but it was warped into a permanent look of anguish. I walked around and saw more faces. Some trees held multiple, all holding looks of great sadness and pain, as if their last moments were spent being fused to these trees while alive. I felt so much hurt for these people. I knew at this point that this couldn't be a coincidence. 
My last rational thought was that maybe someone had carved these. Maybe someone had made this a fucked up art project for the world to see, but... When I continued to walk, I saw a face that... A face that I recognized. Tears started to well up in my eyes. I walked up to the one face that I knew for a fact I had seen before. As soon as I came within arm's reach, I stretched my hand out and ran my fingers down the face of, of my little brother. I knew the face he was making, too. He was crying. To think that his last moments were filled with tears and his eyes made me break down right there. I must have spent the next ten minutes bawling. I refused to leave his side. After all these years, after the wondering, after all the pain, I had finally found him. I had finally found my brother. I wanted to call my parents and call my wife and tell them that I had found him, but as soon as I pulled my phone out, I heard his sweet, innocent voice call my name and tell me to lean in. My body froze. I looked up and stared at his face as he called for me again. I leaned my ear to his mouth, and as soon as he stopped speaking, I sprinted all the way home. I never told my wife the real reason why we moved. I never told my parents that I had found their son. You'd think it'd be hard to keep such a secret and to keep up a lifetime of lies, but honestly, I think to deal with what I found would be much worse. I don't know what to make of my brother now. I don't know what happened to him or all those other people, and I don't want all the great memories I had of that vibrant young boy to be replaced with memories of sadness and loss. But what will always stay consistent is the memory. Because I know what he said to me will stick with me forever, and I will always think about the moment when he coldly stated, I've grown to like it here. I think your boy will too. We tell a ton of scary stories here on the channel, ranging from true crime to some things that just can't be explained. Despite telling all these scary stories, I find myself searching for more all the time, which is why I'm happy to say this video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a new type of documentary streaming membership founded by filmmakers. Their team of producers and curators bring together premium content that dives deep into documentary subject. Magellan TV is also having a buy one get one free gift card sale right now. So when you follow that link, this will show and you can click on it and get you a really, really awesome deal. Don't miss out on this, guys. The best part about Magellan TV, though, isn't the massive library. It's the fact that you can watch all of this absolutely ad-free, and they're always adding new titles, many that are available in 4K. You can stream all the shows on any device in your home, too. Television, phone, tablet, it doesn't matter. You'll have all your favorite shows wherever you are. So if you think you've run out of things to watch, head down to the link below and get Magellan TV free for one month. No promo code, just click the link and you're ready to start watching. And thanks so much to Magellan TV for supporting the channel. Sitting in my car in a dark parking lot at night, I watched a thin man with a large, grotesque yellow smile walk up to the driver's side door with a gun. He politely tapped on the window and motioned for me to roll it down. I sat stunned for a moment before obliging. My heart raced as he calmly stuck the gun in my face and told me to unlock the door. In stark contrast to what one would assume from the weapon in stark contrast to what one would assume from the weapon in his hand and overall disheveled look, he spoke in a confident yet non threatening manner. Listen, James, I just want to talk. Who 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 are you? I stammered out. He widened his smile. Would you mind unlocking the door for me, buddy? 
I slowly shook my head in response, but he simply pushed the gun closer to my face and shot me a look that clearly showed he wasn't really asking. Once he heard the door click open, he strolled around to the front of the car and made his way to the passenger seat, never once taking the gun off of me. After he got comfortable, he seemed to slightly let down his guard as he spoke again. You know, James, I'm really not here to hurt you. The fact of the matter is, I want your opinion on something near and dear to my heart. The fuck are you talking about? I shot back sharply. You're holding me at gunpoint because you want my opinion on something? And how do you know my name? The man laughed. Well, to answer your second question first, I guess you can call it a unique intuition from a long time of observation. He winked before continuing. And to answer your first question, yes. But not because you're special or anything. In fact, you happen to be a completely random piece. You just happen to be in the right place at the right time. Now I was utterly confused. The man was obviously crazy. The fact that he still had that gun pointed towards me meant there was still a genuine possibility that the only way I left that parking lot was in a body bag. I think he sensed my worry when my eyes kept darting back and forth between the gun and his still-smiling face. I got the vibe that he enjoyed the stress I was under. Okay, so what do you want my opinion on? He nodded his head and twirled the gun in his hand playfully before setting it on his lap. Don't try and reach for the gun, kid. I'm a really quick shot, trust me. It wouldn't end well. I nodded as he reached into his pocket and pulled out a cigarette and a lighter. He took a long drag and exhaled before talking again. I know you don't like smoke, but I feel the need coming on strong. This guy must have been doing it for years. Anyway, I wanted your opinion on who to kill. My heart dropped as those words left his lips. I'm sorry, what? I... I I can't be involved in that kind of thing. He picked the gun back up and blew out another puff of smoke. I wouldn't think of it as being involved, per se. You're really just making a suggestion. If it makes you feel any better, this isn't my first rodeo, and I've got a lot of bodies on me. Even took some fine pictures if you'd like to see them. My hand slowly moved toward the handle as I mentally prepared to run. This was crazy. Not only had this person essentially kidnapped me, but they wanted me to be involved in some kind of murder plot. I thought that he was obviously some kind of serial killer and that maybe he was distracted for a split second and I could run to tell the police. At this point, whatever was going on was far bigger than me, and I needed to tell someone. His confidence never wavered. James, I told you I'm a quick shot. You're not going to get very far if you try and run. Really, I don't want to hurt you. Plus, even if you manage to escape and tell the cops like you're thinking, they'd never find me. I told you, kid. I have bodies. Plural. Trust me. There's a damn good reason for what's going on. Now just answer my question and I'll be on my way. I promise. My hand slowly retracted from the door and he nodded in approval. I punched the steering wheel and that damn smile of his indicated that he was enjoying every second of my moral conundrum. (sighs) Just tell me what you want. He paused to cough before taking yet another drag. A puff of smoke accompanied his next set of words. Let's say someone had to hypothetically die tomorrow night. It could either be your mother, your best friend or the father of a sick girl down the street from you. Who would it be? Just let me know, and I'll be on my way towards their house to do what needs to be done. You can't be serious, I screamed. I'm more than serious, James, he calmly responded. And if you try and give me that I can't pick bullshit, I'll just kill all of them. There's no skin off my back. This time I laughed. At that moment, I thought the man had messed up. 
I hadn't been to my mom's house in years, and she was extremely protective of her personal information. She didn't have social media, lived out in the middle of nowhere with my dad, and didn't trust electronic services enough to ever put her information out anywhere. He was lying about knowing where these people were. If he was lying about that, then he was most likely lying about everything else. Hell, the only reason he probably knew my name was because it's so common. I could pick someone at random, and this crazy person would hopefully be on his way to leave me alone. Tick tock, James, he said as I was frozen in thought. Who's it gonna be? What if I picked my mother? I called his bluff. You know where she's at right now. He chuckled. <laughs> of course I do. Prove it, I said, furiously banging my fist on the dashboard. He rolled his eyes and pulled out a phone from his pocket. It only took him a few seconds to type in a location and show me an image of a house that my mom stayed at with my dad. This is her, right? My eyes grew wide. How the hell could he have possibly known that? No. I lied. The man shrugged. Fine. Doesn't matter. If that's who you pick, then I'll show up and kill whoever does live there. And trust me, you can call the cops and hope that they'll get there before I do. But it won't make a difference. He paused for a moment and thought. In fact, it might be a little weird that you had knowledge of a murder before it happened. Old people with a big life insurance plan being killed by a child who then goes and feigns confusion and grief to the police. It's a story that's played out many times before, and I can see the headlines now. Man hires killer to take out parents for insurance money. Gets life in prison. He then leaned in close to me. Is that what you want, kid? I didn't respond. He took another drag on his seemingly endless cigarette. Didn't think so, he said before blowing out another puff of smoke. So, who's he going to be? I'm not going to ask again. I shook my hand and weakly put my hands on the steering wheel. The father of the sick girl, I suppose. Just please, leave. His wide smile grew even wider. He set the gun down entirely and stated in the mocking tone, Thank you for your cooperation. He shoved open the passenger side door and put a foot out before stopping. Oh, there is one thing I should mention. He then turned back around to me. That little girl's father is a real piece of shit, you know. Beats his wife, cheats on her with a lot of women in the neighborhood. Guy's even contemplated suffocating his own daughter to get an insurance payout. That's not even to mention the wild views he holds on his personal life. He's even making one of those current employees' lives a living hell because she won't sleep with him. But he's fired people for much less uh, reasonable matters and then gone on to ruin their lives even further. Overall, just an awful, scummy human being. He violently coughed and rolled down the window to spit. Damn, this body sucks. Anyway, that being said, the other two choices are somehow worse. Can't really get into it because you didn't pick them, but it really makes you think, huh? How are your mother and your best friend worse people than absolute scum? <laughs> Guess that's up for you to find out, right? <laughs> anyway, consider this a kindness. Hopefully we never meet again. With that, he simply closed the door and walked away. I think I sat in that parking lot for another half hour, contemplating what the fuck just happened. And then I drove to a nearby liquor store, bought a bottle of tequila, and drank myself to sleep. The next morning, I woke up to news crews down the street and police tape sectioning off what looked to be a bloody crime scene. I come to find out later that evening everything he said was true. The man indeed was a horrible person, and what was one public support towards an unbelievable cruel incident soon turned into a feeling that somehow justice had been accomplished. I never told the police what happened. Maybe I should have, but I don't know. 
I suppose at the end of the day, I just didn't want to be involved more than I had already had been. Conversations with my parents and my friend had been weird too. I found myself pulling back further and further from them. If what that man said was true, what on earth could they have been up to in their private lives? And was I in some sort of danger because of it? I didn't know if I was more afraid of that man or the people I've loved for damn near my entire life. I'm also questioning how he knew so much about that man and about me and if I was supposedly picked at random. That comment about this body had me on edge too. It's as if it didn't belong to him. So much about this situation has me asking questions that can't be answered and I don't know what to do. I suppose the only thing for now is to get another drink and try to forget his kindness. Thank you.